Welcome to Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. A world where coming in second place is not an option, but where principle-centered winning is the only approach. Good morning and welcome to Government Contracting Weekly. I'm Hilary Fordwich of Key Solutions. Frequently, I hear from CEOs and other leaders in the government contracting community that their core differentiator, their key to success, is simply their people. People who are not just great at what they do, but people who are passionate about what they do. That's why we're devoting today's entire program to the competitive advantage that comes from harnessing people for success. Our first guest this morning is Deb Alderson, the Executive Vice President and COO of SRA. Deb, as you're about to hear, is an absolute master at building and maintaining an organization of outstanding leadership and outstanding team members. After Deb, you'll meet Bill Kaplan, the founder of Working Knowledge. As always, there's a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. Good morning and welcome to our segment where I have with us an expert from this region, a tremendous leader, Deb Alderson. Good morning, Deb. Hi, Hilary. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for coming in this morning. And thank Deb you. is the uh, Executive Vice President and the COO of SRA International. And she has an extensive background. Actually, most of her background is in government contracting. You had actually had kind of an interesting start <laughs> many yes, years I ago. Did. Yes, yes, I did, Hillary. I was, was... A, I was a GS4 clerk typist mm -hmm. who couldn't type. So have any of you done that? <laughs> I mean, I think that's <laughs> fascinating. But it's a good job she couldn't type because she went on to be a very senior executive. But tell us about a little bit about your background and what it is you brought to SRA and why you're at SRA. Well, thank you, Hillary, again for having me today. Um, well, I've been in government service for, let's say, 25 plus plus years. Uh, I don't want to hit the 30 mark, but I'm pretty darn close. Uh, I did get into this business out of necessity, basically. I started as a GS4 clerk typist after graduate school, couldn't find a job, uh, was married, uh, still married for 33 years. Congratulations. My dad, thank you very Good. much. Yeah. Two wonderful sons, uh, 28 and 23, so they're rocking. Um, but uh, I needed a job, so I. Uh, entered government service and from there started my network which again is something I'm sure you realize Hillary from talking to a lot of the guests that you do your networks critical yes. in this business yes so from there got into defense contracting and found that I just had this passion for it uh, I had never been in the service no one in my military in my family had ever been in the, the service so this was a way that I could actually serve yeah and, and I you had, wanted to serve you have a good commitment to this exactly country. And, yeah. and when you look at the leaders you're working for and the risks that they take it just it Again, it just created this passion for me that I wanted to continue to support the mission. Um, I also had, uh, growing up, uh, my mother as a forcing function for and she's me. She's been a big influence on you in terms of actually even your management technique. Yes, and, very yeah. much so. She uh, early on uh, raised three children on her own. Uh, taught us early on that there were there was no glass ceiling. There was nothing that we couldn't do, and she constantly pushed me. But while she pushed me to be to succeed and be uh, successful in whatever I did, she kept reminding me of the value of people and to always remember where you came from and to make sure that you treated people like you wanted to be treated. And that's tremendous. That's yeah. a huge, huge differentiator too. Exactly, Hillary, and I've, I've taken that with me throughout my career. It's wonderful. As you saw, Deb was influenced tremendously by a very involved, very dedicated mother who inspired her. And one of the things her mother always had an emphasis about was people and the people around her. And Deb's actually taken this into her modus operandi, her mantra, her vision, her mission at um, SRA in terms of employee engagement. Yes. So maybe you could describe to our audience what that is, what you were imparted with when you were younger and, and what it means. Right. Thank you, Hillary. Um, when I talk about employee engagement, it's uh, focused on internal and external. And again, it goes back to the basics that I talked about that my mother, Pat Petrovic, taught me as I was growing That's up. That's her name, Pat yeah. Petrovic. <laughs> right. That's a little shout right, out exactly. here. Hi, shout Pat. out for yeah, mom. Good morning, shout Pat. Out for mom. Um, and the fact that not only do people need to be engaged within the organization, but show an engagement when they're supporting the mission and the customer base. So you need to spend a lot of time with people to, again, make sure that you have an open communication 
in, inside the organization, make sure that they understand the strategy of the organization, but most importantly, make sure they understand the role that they play within the growth of the organization. To make them feel an important, integral part, exactly. like they matter. Exactly, yeah. and, and help them understand that their success is directly related to the, the company's success, mm -hmm. and that's one thing we really focus on at SRA. And we lead from the top. So we make sure that we have a lot of open communication, that the people understand the strategy going forward, and most importantly, again, that they understand how they fit. Yeah. And then we're totally aligned when we're, when we're market facing. Now then you take that to how they behave once they're aligned and they feel engaged and they feel a part of the organization when they're focusing with the customer. Well, of course, there they're going to be more focused on the mission. They're going to be more excited about succeeding. They're going to give them more than 100%. Right. And have you linked this all into their compensation and made it formal as well as informal and throughout everything yes. that you do with them? Yeah. yeah, well, there's the hard and the soft, right? Yeah, so, so you have co hard combination. Right, exactly. So you have the hard objectives as far as, you know, top line, bottom line uh, types of results. I spend a lot of time looking at their turnover, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm looking at the management structure because that's a true sign to me that are they really engaging with their team? Oh, right. What is it in America? Or was it seven percent of Americans leave just for financial remuneration? All the rest is due to lack of challenges. Exactly, yeah, that's are, the are related one issue. to their management, yes. and that's directly yes. related to their management. So I spend a lot of time with the first line supervisors, making sure that they understand the importance of engagement going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so you do have the hard metrics, as we talked about, that you might have in their performance reviews. Um, but there's the more softer skills that you you need to spend equal amount of time on. So leadership training, management training. Uh, again, leading from the top, we have all employee calls. Anytime we're going to have a change in the company, we spend a lot of time getting people comfortable with that change. So it doesn't impact their outwardly facing service to the mission, to right, the customer. Because right. you can pay people to work for you, but you can't buy their hearts. It exactly. sounds like you're getting to the heart of people. Exactly. Exactly. And a key part of that, Hillary, too, is making yourself available, mm -hmm. right? So you can't lead from emails. Yes, and you're making yourself available as a role model mm -hmm. um, practicing what you preach. That's yes. what I hear is on the yeah. street at, from SRA yes. too. Yes, right. exactly. Yes. It's just, it's, it's really important to me to make sure that I am there when people need me at any level in the organization. I'm, I'm really proud to stay. I'm still mentoring people that I worked with at SAIC, Anion, and Techmatic, so three companies back. So she's practicing what she preaches yes. as well. Yes, yes I am, yes I am. So you've heard about the internal mantra of employee engagement. Now we want to pivot a little to what that means externally for SRA. But first of all, sort of the bridge is to talk about what does this mean in terms of the company and or the individual. So Deb, my question to you is there may be members of our audience watching saying, well, we do all of that anyway. Uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't. How do you, number one, determine, mm -hmm. uh, give us a specific example of what it is, and then is it the company or the employee's responsibility? Well, I think uh, one way to determine whether you have employee engagement is, is literally the energy you feel in the space, mm -hmm. right? So we've all been in meetings where you can look around and tell whether people are engaged or not, are they zoning out? And then, of course, once they leave the meeting, uh, do they understand the message? Yes. And are they imparting that message throughout the organization? As I talked to you earlier, Hillary, I spend a lot of time talking at various levels within the, within the company. Whoever wants to come visit me, doors always open. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you can really get a pulse for whether your messaging and your alignment is happening from your employment engagement. Because if I'm talking to someone at a various levels and they're asking me questions that in fact we have been answering or trying to get the company aligned around, uh, then I know that we, we have a break in the communication right, cycle. Yeah. So, so, you, so it's somewhat it, um, intangible right. and it's somewhat subjective, but it's right. something that you basically can judge. Exactly. And I suppose that you give um, guidance to your managers how they would judge that the exactly. same way that you do? Exactly. And you'd see that with the engagement surveys that we do in the company. Also, our CEO, Bill Ballhouse, has a blog that people use that's very open. And you can tell if there's breaks in the communication. Uh, through reading his blog. So it, is, it is objective too because yes. you're getting quantifiable results from the survey. Exactly, yes. exactly. So uh, so there's lots of different ways to gauge it. Again, you have the hard way, hard uh, metrics with the engagement surveys, but there's more feel in the organization for it. that you have. Yes, now, exactly. what about then, let's turn to external. So what are the ramifications of this approach for your custom interface? You touched on this right. a little bit, that it means right. obviously people are feeling great and happy, right. committed to the mission, they're, they're yeah. conveying that. Some examples of how you judge that externally and what it means to the customer. Well, it's, I mean, right now our customer is facing a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of, um, 
well, let me, how do I put this? Uh, they have a lot of pressure. And By challenges. Doing, uh, yeah, challenges. challenges. The whole industry. Pressure. Exactly, the board. exactly. Who doesn't? Yes. So we, they have pressures, they're uh, concerned with the budget. Uh, so right now, they need support from companies like SRA and, and our colleagues that really understand their mission. They're engaged. They understand that they're going to have to do more with less. Yes. That they're going to have to Everyone always, does. Exactly, Everybody, always yes. give it 100%. Yeah. Well, in order for our team to be out there supporting the customer, they need to have their head wrapped around what's going on at SRA. You don't want them to be distracted. Right, right, yeah. And it's somewhat of a pessimistic milieu, so you've got to boost their spirits as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they need to be excited about the future. They need to know that they're part of a company that has open communication that's focused on their success. And then you send them out in the field, and as we know, a majority of all of our people now are client site, so they're working right there with the customer. Well, the worst type of employee to have client side is one that's not happy with happy, the company. Yes. What is that? I love the expression, um, every day you're either fired with passion right. or you will be fired exactly. with passion. Exactly. Bum, 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 bum. Exactly. So you want people going out there passionate about I SRA passionate. and their job. Exactly. And that whole attitude actually intimidates the competition. Yes, that's fantastic. So if you have a yeah. recompete coming up, you know, people will actually go, I'm not bidding against SRA. Because well, their team people, is locked up. Yeah. Customer loves them. They know what they're doing. They're focused. They're aligned. They're serving the mission. That's fabulous. Actually, yeah. earlier this year, there was an OOPS conference, an ounce of prevention conference that Crawl and Mooring put on. And everybody there was saying, you know, the marketplace is so pessimistic. Well, SRA is cheering yeah. it up. So yeah. thanks to SRA. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs>So you heard Deb say, and I do believe there are many uh, government contractors out there that can be kind of scared of SRA. They don't want a bit of SRAs in the mix due to their uh, passion of all of their people. Uh, you might actually not want to watch any more of this show if you don't want to hear anything else that might scare you because there, there are many other things that you have going mm -hmm. on that make you really superior in terms of competitively in the marketplace. Yeah. Maybe you can share with our audience what they are. Well, I thank you, Hillary, for making that comment because I want as many of our competitors to be scared of us as, as we can yes. manage here because uh, <laughs> that's one of my primary goals. Um, I feel that my role at, at SRA is basically to create opportunities for our people. And in order to do that, one of the uh, bumper stickers I walk around with is growth is everyone's business. Okay. And that ties directly to what we're talking about with employee engagement. So when we have people out supporting the customer, I expect them to be totally focused on the mission. I expect them to be looking for ways to be more efficient. Because that's what your customers really want. Exactly. Yeah, they don't want you to perpetuate SRA there. Exactly, right. exactly. So we're not the type of company that goes in and says, well, if you need us to do this, it's going to cost that. And you're going to be 20 right. more people, and that's 20 more seats exactly. for us. No. Exactly. Instead, we're the kind of company that goes in and says, well, you're doing it with 10, we can do it with 8. Yeah. We can right. help you not just fill your mission, but more cost effectively. Exactly, exactly. And by uh, the reason that we can do this is through the capabilities that we bring to our customers. Uh, we've invested in cloud computing, we've invested in mobility, we've invested in IT infrastructure. So a lot of ways that we can help our customers do more with less. Now again, we have to tie this back to what makes people engagement a part of this. Mm -hmm. Well, they have to understand the company strategy, they have to be aligned with our strategy, and going back to a key point that we talked about earlier, they have to understand how their success is tied to the company's success and now tied to the success of the customer. So they don't feel alienated or distant from the brand, they feel like they own it. And exactly. They're it. Yes, and when wonderful. they're on site or off site supporting a customer, they're proud to be a part of SRA and they're very proud to be a part of supporting that customer's mission. Well, speaking that's about your employees, what about teaming partners and how yeah. do you, one, select them, what are you looking for, and how do you make them? proud to be a part of SRA too. Is well, it difficult or well, easy? Well, you know, we talk to a lot of partners and I actually started in a small business so I'm really appreciative of how difficult it is to be a small business with all the larger companies out there and to find your spot. Um, and particularly now, exactly. it's been even tougher for smaller exactly. companies. Exactly. But now there's a lot more small business uh, prime opportunity so I'm finding at SRA we're partnering a lot more whether we're the prime or they're the prime. But when looking for a quality small business sub, again, I want that energy. I want that commitment to the mission. I also want to talk to, to the leadership of that company about how aligned are they? Yes. I mean, do they actually know where they're going? Um, how happy are their people and right, what yes. they're doing? And then, That's an unusual question. I get a lot, I guess a lot of companies don't actually yeah, even exactly. hear that. Yeah, exactly. And you can feel it in the meeting. So mm -hmm. I'll meet with the leadership. I'll meet with who they're going to bid on the job and you can get a feel for not only their knowledge base but are they excited about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Then once we win the job with our partners they're totally involved in our engagement. So we have all hands meetings supporting that program. They're included in that. That's phenomenal. They feel like part of Team SRA yes. and I think that's very, very important. And very different and kind of distinctive, yeah. Thank yes. you, Deb.
So as one of our regular viewers, I'm sure you know that Key Solutions is the force behind Government Contracting Weekly. Key Solutions provides strategy, capture and proposal support services all around principled-centered winning. Today, I'm delighted, as you know, to have with me Deb Alderson, the Executive Vice President and COO of SRA. And SRA has unique ways of going to market that we haven't heard often, particularly in terms of their employee engagement. But Deb, I'd love for you to share with our audience, in addition mm -hmm. to that, what are some of the keys to winning from the SRA perspective? Well, in addition to employee engagement, uh, you certainly want to have an understanding of the mission you know, prior to putting the bid in. Uh, we have a very robust capture process, so we make sure that we're working the solutions early prior to the bid going in. Um, I personally like to uh, have a very clear understanding of the competitive landscape. I find that fun. What have they done right? What have they done wrong? To unseat an incumbent. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, so, and where might there be a, like a, a weak link mm -hmm. that you could go after? And mm -hmm. I know you guys are very, very familiar with this. So yeah, it's, key solutions. We are, but then our audience yeah. isn't. So it's yeah, good exactly. for them to hear it. I mean, it's going back to basics. Mm -hmm. You know, being prepared for the bid early, making sure that you're doing the customer calls mm -hmm. so you understand what their concerns are, what their desires oh, are. Like a third party assessment. Exactly. You're also having them uh, talk to. Yeah. Right, exactly. And then taking a look at really, if you're going after an incumbent capture, uh, how is that incumbent doing? Yes. And then making that determination, should you really invest in that bid? Because well, no company's perfect, there's, there's some weak links, but you might determine this company's doing such a good job, we right. shouldn't. Exactly, yes. and you hit a key point for me, Hillary, because that's how I want everyone to look at SRA. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Deb. I think you. you've s shared some very unique perspectives yeah. and given our audience something a little bit different to take away this, with this Sunday, so thank you so much. Thank you, Hillary. Appreciate the opportunity. As you've just seen, Deb Alderson is tremendous and has done a superb job of engaging and motivating her team to perform at an exceptionally high level. Now I'd like you to meet Bill Kaplan, the founder of Working Knowledge, who has devoted much of his career to the study of government contracting in the workforce and has some good advice for us all. Good morning and welcome back to our Government Contracting Weekly segment where I'm talking with a local expert. This morning I'm delighted to have with me Bill Kaplan. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Bill is the founder of Working Knowledge CSP. Uh, it's a, an area that's very hot right now and actually critical in terms of knowledge management. He's also written a book and he has some interesting insights into a topic that most of you, I believe, are facing in terms of the transferring of knowledge to certainly the next generation. Bill, you have lots of things to share with us, but I'd like to ask you to at least give the audience a little bit of a sense of your background. Uh, you have served in the Air Force. You have an extensive government contractor background. Yeah, I've spent uh, 40 years in uh, federal acquisition mm -hmm. in the Air Force and in the public sector. Uh, I've got 15 years of hands-on, roll up your sleeves, knowledge management practice. And I find myself at an interesting intersection between the issues of knowledge and the acquisition workforce right now. So you have, and he has credibility then really on all sides because you've walked the talk on, on every area. True. And then what about your um, work that you um, were in, in terms of the procurement side? What have you seen and how has it evolved? And in many ways, it's stayed a lot the same. Mm -hmm. There's still the challenges of workforce training. There's still the challenges of workforce learning. There's still the relationship issues between industry and government. And very often, um, the ability to quickly capture, adapt, transfer, and reuse knowledge can make a significant difference in the outcome in those relationships. Yes, in terms of the success of any particular contractor. Yes. There are different types of knowledge that has to be transferred, and Bill's here this morning to talk with me about a very specific type of knowledge with your firm that you're focusing on. We focus on the um, ability of an organization to capture, adapt, transfer, and use what it knows about what it does. Knowledge management is focused on improving performance at the individual team and organization level. And what we know is that organizations that have the ability to leverage both all of the information in their organization and all of the experience, the head knowledge, the things that people know that aren't written down, are much better able to adapt to change, much better able to solve problems, and are able, much more effectively able to deliver solutions, better solutions, and make better decisions. So is some of this covered in your book? Yes, the book uh, was published in 2010. It's uh, called Losing Your Minds, 
Uh, which we don't want you to do, but we want you to improve your mind by reading the book, maybe, yes, yeah. Uh, capture, retaining, and leveraging organizational knowledge. And it's very much a book that describes the challenges in the environment and then provides organizations um, some how-to on how to deal with the issues of knowledge loss uh, due to workforce turnover. And you've got some very practical tips in there from some <clears throat> case studies. Yes, I do. Um, the bottom line is that organizations have to think strategically about knowledge. Um, the idea that you can wait until people leave your workforce to do exit interviews or start to capture what they know. It's too late. It's way too late. Yes. And what the organization needs to understand, whether it's a public sector organization or a private sector organization, is that they have to begin to capture the knowledge of their workforce the moment that someone starts working. So that over a period of time, they're able to evolve a very comprehensive knowledge base so that when people leave, regardless of the discipline or subject matter area, there are other people that are able to step in, leverage what they've already, what they already have, and leverage what they already know and can learn from other folks. And, and so you don't lose your mind. The, this book, uh, Bill's book, Losing Your Mind, it's actually good because while it's really very targeted and, and does cover government contractors, it's general in nature too. So it has a lot of applicability depending on what kind of firm uh, somebody runs. That's true. Uh, acquisition is an extremely broad, long-term, and very important um, career career field and subject area, but the tenets that are talked about in the book apply to any organization, public or private. And, and on the commercial side as well as the, the defense side. Absolutely. Yes. While there are those that look at the contentious issue of bridging the chasm between business and government and look at it in a negative perspective, we've actually had a number of guests on Government Contracting Weekly who've been optimistic. Uh, to name a few, probably Bill McNally at NASA and Elliot Branch uh, from Navy Procurement, as well as actually Desmond Brown in the Office of uh, Small Business. We've also had Dan Gordon on from George Washington University, and he likewise is very positive about the direction we're going in. I'm with Bill Kaplan, as you know, this morning, and his book, Losing Your Mind, addresses this to a certain extent, and he's also got some thoughts in terms of that chasm. Tell us, the audience, what could knowledge management do in terms of helping bridge that chasm even further? One of the, yeah, one of the, um, the big issues is the quality of the proposals that the government puts out and subsequently the quality of the, I mean, the request for proposal and the proposals the RFPs, that, yeah. and the proposals that industry turns back in. Um, there's an experience issue with many organizations in the federal government. The quality of the RFPs that goes out isn't what it should be, and the proposals coming in can't possibly respond to them if the proposals are written poorly. One of the things that would be a, a very unique and in a way to do this is, is after um, an organization is a successful officer and a, offer and it wins the proposal, one of the things they could do is down, sit down with the contracting team and together do a learning after activity that talks about what were the objectives of the proposal, of the RFP, um, how, did the, how effective was the proposal in responding, what were some of the learned lessons from both sides so that not only can the government improve their ability to deliver higher quality RFPs that meet the requirements of the government, but at the same time, industry can also learn what it takes to also deliver a higher quality proposal that helps the government to meet those needs. So for the, for the moment and for future procurements, it will be beneficial to both sides, both yeah, parties. Absolutely. And, and the issue has to do with taking the time to learn after you do something. Very often when people complete a project or they complete a proposal, they're done and they move off to the next thing. The earlier question you talked about uh, with the loss of knowledge in the workforce, the idea that you can actually change your behavior so that when you're finished with a project, or in this case a proposal, you actually take time with your team to sit down and look back and reflect on what you've learned so that you can use it the next time. That's how you begin to build a knowledge base that's effective for that's future That's looking business. at future precedents <clears throat> and being diagnostic about them. Absolutely. Yeah, and in golf we call that muscle memory. <laughs> As you know, my exit question is usually with regard to the keys to winning. Uh, Key Solutions is the force behind this program and delivers strategy, capture, and proposal support services. But this morning, having Bill Kaplan here from Working Knowledge CSP, Bill has a little bit of a different uh, angle for us, as you've seen, and he has some not only remedies that he shared with us, but also the one thing that he recommends 
both government could do and government contractors could adopt in terms of making the acquisition process better. So Bill, over to you for what's the one thing government could be doing to improve the acquisition process? I think there's solutions for both of them. And that, yes. and that, that focus is on understanding that the ability to capture and reuse knowledge, you have to start somewhere. It doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to be expensive. And very often there's a lot of things that organizations are already doing. So if you can't understand knowledge management in depth, at least look to the people that are out there doing the work because the practitioners, the people that do the work, will always be innovative in their ability to try to understand what they have to have in order to be able to do the work. So something's better than nothing. Have a process and start somewhere is what you're saying. Yeah, Absolutely. both sides, and, yes. And leadership, both in the public sector and the private sector, needs to understand that the people that do the work usually know best about how to do the work. And they will tell you what some of the things are that they need in order to be successful. That leadership piece, that knowledge leadership piece is very, very important. Recognizing that knowledge management is not a top-down only process. It's support from the top and organizations that are able to provide their workforces with the knowledge that they need to be successful will not only retain those workforces, they'll stay there, turnover will be lower, and the organization will be much more successful over the long run. And actually turnover is a big expense in of itself. I mean, that detracts from the bottom line right there. Organizations, particularly the multi-generational nature of the workforce now, if people don't find the sources and solutions that they need to deliver the work that their organization wants to do, they're not getting what they need to be successful, they will go someplace else. People show up every day wanting to do a good job. And the organizations that recognize that and provide them with the tools, the techniques, and the capability to learn while they perform will be the organizations that tend to keep that workforce and be successful over the long run. So what you're saying too is as the economy picks up, which we all know it will, we don't know exactly when, but when it picks up and really becomes a roaring engine again, the retention of good employees is going to become ever more critical. So at least Bill has provided us this morning, particularly for those leaders watching with one of the tactics and strategies you can adopt in terms of retaining your exceptional workforce. Uh, they always say the cream of the crop leaves, the dead wood remains. So that's how you can retain some of the cream of your crop of employees. Bill, thank you for joining me this morning. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. I'd like to thank both of our guests this morning, Bill Kaplan of Working Knowledge and Deb Alderson of SRA for their valuable insights. And of course, I'd like to thank you, our viewers, for making Government Contracting Weekly a regular part of your busy early morning Sunday routine. See you next week. been watching Government Contracting Weekly, sponsored each week by AOC Key Solutions Incorporated. Government Contracting Weekly is the only television program devoted exclusively to the competitive and dynamic world of government contracting. For additional information, comments, questions, or suggestions, please write us at governmentcontractingweekly.com. <laughs>